Good morning. I'm Mike Michel, a member of the Board of Trustees, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Brunswick, Maine. Today is Sunday, August 29, 2021. The topic of our service today is Sometimes a Light Surprises, and the worship leader is our own Grace Lewis McLaren. She will stir up some memories and share them in the context of our recent common experiences. Grace has enriched our church for many years with her musicianship, the hymns she wrote, her insights, and her continued work and dedication to our church community. She also enjoys traveling, cooking, and gardening. Our charity with soul for August is Thedford Housing whose mission is to empower people to move from homelessness to home. Please give generously. Enjoy the service.
Good morning. My name is Grace. I spend my summers here in Maine. My family, my father's family is like five generations of being in Maine. So Maine is really where my roots are. But since my husband John died about seven years ago, um, my kids, my two daughters who live in California, wanted me to come and spend the winters with them. So that's what I do. I spend winters out there. And last winter was really a strange one, as you all know. Um, around January of 2020, I was in a pretty sad place. It was just very depressing what was happening with this country. and. Um, I just didn't see much hope, besides which the family that lived underneath me, my daughter and son-in-law, um, were of a different political persuasion from mine, and I really had to be careful about even talking with them. But I had a neighbor across the street who was a friend who was um, a liberal Democrat, and she would come over and visit with me, and talking with her really helped. And one day she brought over this carved um, piece that I could put up on a bookshelf, and it was the word hope, H-O-P-E, in white wooden letters. And I set it up on one of my bookshelves in front of a small painting of Pemaquid Light that I had brought out to California. I like to bring reminders of Maine with me to California. And so I had propped this word hope up in front of this painting of Pemaquid. And one morning, I just happened to notice that the way the sun was coming in the window, it was hitting the back of that hope word and reflecting onto the painting of Pemaquid in a way that was just surprising and delightful. And just that that moment, that little notice of the way that light hit something, I, I found absolutely wonderful and delightful. And I was able to take a picture of it. And I wanted to share that with you today. Lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Ours is no again come. Hello and good morning. My name is Tobin and I serve as your Director of Religious Exploration. Today we have a story about how sometimes things don't go the way that we think they should, but if we accept things the way that they are, it helps us to realize how good we really do have it. I hope you enjoy it. Happiness Doesn't Come From Headstands, written and illustrated by Tamara Levitt. Read with permission from Wisdom Publications. A note from the author, dedicated to Eden, Aram, and Joshua, who I hope will always know happiness regardless of what they can or cannot do. Leela loved to do yoga. She practiced each week with her best friend Lyle. They could do all sorts of fancy poses, like downward dog. 
tree pose, and cat pose. But there was one pose that Leela couldn't do. She couldn't do a headstand. Each time Leela tried, she counted one, two, three, then she swung her legs into the air and kerplunk. I can't do it, she shouted from the floor. I can't do it, she sighed at the dinner table. <laughs> she mumbled in the washroom, meaning I can't do it, of course. And when she tried again before bedtime, guess what happened? Leela couldn't do it, just like she told herself. One, two, three, kerplunk. Night after night, Leela dreamed of all the things she couldn't do. Roller skate, skydive, headstand, bake a cake. One day, Lyle and Leela went to yoga class. When some of the children started doing headstands, Leela watched them with envy. I can do it, Sari sang. I can do it, Shauna shouted. I can do it, Barry bragged. It's too bad you can't too. Leela plopped down on her yoga mat. I'm frustrated, she cried. So Lyle helped Leela. One, I think you've got it, Lyle cheered. Two, I think I do too, Leela shouted. You can let go now. Three, kerploink. After class, as Lyle and Leela walked home, Leela tried not to cry. If only I could do headstands, she said. Then I would be happy. But you can do lots of things, Lyle said. You can ice skate and sing and draw stars in the sand. True, Leela said, I can. So instead of just waiting for headstand happiness, Leela found some fun. She frolicked in the fall. She whirled in the winter. She skipped in the spring. And as the seasons changed, so did Leela. Ha! Barry snickered as he spotted Leela in the summertime. You still can't do a headstand. No, not yet, Leela replied. But maybe I'll be able to do one soon. And even if I can't, there are all sorts of things I can do, just like this. Then Leela leaped into a somersault and rolled down the hill laughing because happiness doesn't come from headstands.
Every morning the world is created. Under the orange sticks of the sun, the heaped ashes of the night turn into leaves again. And fasten themselves to the high branches. And the ponds appear like black cloth on which are painted islands of summer lilies. If it's in your nature to be happy, you will swim away along the soft trails for hours, your imagination alighting everywhere. And if your spirit carries within it the thorn that is heavier than lead, if it's all you can do to keep on trudging, there is still somewhere deep within you a beast shouting that the earth is exactly what it wanted to be. Each pond with its blazing lilies is a prayer heard and answered lavishly every morning. Whether, whether or not, not you, you have, have ever dared, dared to be happy, happy whether, whether or not you have, have ever dared, dared to, to pray. pray. My Uncle Roger was a man of few words. He was a devoted nature lover. Like Rachel Carson, he understood the links of human interference with the life cycles of the killdeer, um, the common loon, the osprey. And when he was employed as a caretaker for the New England Music Camp in Sydney, Maine, he convinced decision makers there to stop using weed killer and insect-reducing chemicals. He also started a tradition of summer climbs up Tumble Down Mountain in Weld, Maine, and always there was a nature lesson, a lesson of respect during those climbs. I think I was about 10 when Uncle Roger and I took a nighttime canoe trip across Lake Messalonsky. In those days, you didn't need running lights. I'm sure we had life jackets and a flashlight with us, but it was a very still night, no hint of a breeze, an occasional hoot of a loon. The lake's surface was black and shining. Uncle Roger was an expert silent paddler. I had to be very, very careful, no splashing. About halfway across that mile wide lake, he suggested we stop and rest our paddles and look up. Oh, wow. 
It was the Milky Way. Absolutely brilliant. And so, so, so silent. I don't know about you, but moments like that are markers for me for my entire life. The theme of our summer services this year has been telling our story. Most of you know me as a person for whom music is central. My mother was a violinist. She tried to teach me the violin, but it didn't take. I played piano from the time I was about four. I had lessons and it seems like I had a competitive drive. I really liked performing. And by the time I was finished with high school, playing the piano was what I did. It was really the only thing that I did. I decided I wanted to go to Eastman School of Music and I had noticed in the catalog that if you were an organ major, you started with Organ 101. So um, being a smart ass type person, I said at my audition, well, could you admit me as an organ major? And they, of course, looked over their glasses and said, well, that would be highly unusual. But I did get admitted as an organ major and I had no bad habits to unlearn. So I got to play the pipe organ and I want to tell you, it is a power trip. And I've had opportunities to sit on the organ consoles of many wonderful instruments here and in Europe, some historic ones, as well as some wonderful contemporary organs. And, and I've just had a marvelous opportunity, both in organ and in composition. I've also heard music that I've written sung by many thousand people at GAs, um, just huge, huge crowds in convention centers. And I wanna tell you, that's an incredible thrill, an incredible thrill. But beyond the satisfaction in this, music has also provided me with emotional balance, I mean, especially in this past year and a half. Like many of you, I spent most of the time in isolation. Yeah, there was no excuse for not reading some of the big books I had acquired. Um, I wrote letters, I kept journals, I wrote memoirs, but it was the ability to play music that really lifted me during the times when the loneliness dragged me down. So I had this electronic keyboard in my garage top flat in California, and that enabled me to record hymn and anthem accompaniments and preludes. And Judd Caswell talked me through the process of transferring these recordings so he could incorporate them into our UUCB services. Heidi Neufeld sent out my recorded accompaniments to every choir member so they could individually sing, and then she patiently would create an electronic choir by matching each of those voices to the accompaniment. Justine, our interim minister, Heidi, our choir director, and lots of behind the work scene. And I wanna tell you that those Sunday services that were created were just, I think, some of the best Sunday worship services going. I would get to watch them maybe two weeks after I'd done some recording, and I'd sit there seven o'clock West Coast time and watch these services and just think, what an incredible privilege, what a fabulous time we live in to be able to do this. And those were some of the best services, and I watched quite a number of them. Now, I just might be a little bit biased. My relationship with the UU Church of Brunswick goes back to the 70s. I was employed full-time, often more than full-time, as a director of sales for the Eastland Hotel in Portland. On Sundays, I had church jobs, kind of as a balance. And I heard somewhere that the Brunswick Unitarians had um, bought or taken over a pipe organ from a church that had gone out of business in Brunswick in uh, Augusta and they had pipes and wind chests and things all over Brunswick in their sun porches and barns 
And uh, I thought, well, this sounds like an opportunity. I mean, how many times in a lifetime does one get to design and build an organ? So I went sailing into the UU church and met the minister, Will Saunders, and we started talking about organ building. We hired a builder, a guy who was retired, and this was a hobby of his. And we had to move all of those heavy church pews. Remember those heavy church pews? They had to be moved down to the church basement so the church uh, sanctuary floor was empty. And then it was filled with pipes, ranks of pipes. That's the type of pipe that's one particular sound. And we covered the floor of that room with all sorts of organ stuff, deciding what we could and couldn't use in the given space that that church had at the time. The project took the entire summer, and I think it went into November, I think it was November, when I played a dedication recital, and that included the music of Bach, Hindemith, and Dupre. And the church had a serviceable pipe organ, which lasted about 25 years. The console had deteriorated several years before we had the fire, but the pipes were still in place. Both of my daughters came of age in the UU Church in Brunswick. Mary, my oldest daughter, volunteered in the nursery. Laura, who was two years younger, had the distinction of twice being kicked out of a worship service, once for uncontrolled giggling and once for bringing her uncontrolled parrot to the blessing of the animals. Mary is now the DRE of a UU church in San Diego. Laura is an international pilot with American Airlines. My 21-year marriage to their father, however, did not survive. And folks from the UU Church functioned as a support group for me during those difficult times. I met John McLaren at the UU Church. He had been asked to take part in our fall music festival. And I was the director of music. My 15 and 17-year-old daughters, plus my hotel career, filled my life. I thought, well, that didn't square with John's intentions. Will Saunders officiated at our wedding in August of 1982. John's parents, having left their native Scotland in 1951, had settled in the San Diego area. And that's where John, from the age of seven, grew up, learning to swim, to surf, to help build their home and to adjust his broad Scottish to the American language that Californians could understand. One of our core values was support of our elders. John's parents needed us then. That meant moving from Maine to California, restarting our lives on another coast. I had not met his folks before we married. They were warm and welcoming, but I could not understand them. If you've ever been to Glasgow, you understand that Glaswegian is a language unto itself. By 1986, we had moved seven times in the San Diego area. We had become parents of a son who was claimed as their treasure by their Scottish grandparents. Fruit spoils, you cannot spoil a bairn. Both grandparents rallied to care for their wee bairn while John and I worked. I was hired by the First UU Church of San Diego as administrative assistant. The church had two full-time ministers, a full-time DRE, a fine music staff, and they were in the middle of an enormous building project as a result of a very successful capital campaign. The membership was close to 1,000. So my job was uh, not quite as all-consuming as being a hotel executive, but that experience certainly came in handy. During the 80s, I was actively engaged in composing. Being on the staff of a large church, I had a readily available group of folks on whom to test my creations. Throwing a newly composed hymn at a congregation was certainly a way to learn what was immediately singable and what was not. The songs that worked, I saved and photocopied. Pretty soon, I was carrying collections of my songs to other churches in Pacific Southwest District and doing workshops 
with 15 or so handwritten Xeroxed hymns. And then one day, a woman handed me a sizable check with the stipulation that I was to buy music writing software, a new thing at that time, and publish my songs in book form. The first edition of Songs of Grace came out in the early 90s. And 10 years later, I needed to produce a second edition with larger print and a few additional songs. Meanwhile, I had written several choral anthems and had been asked to serve as a resource person on the UUA's Hymnal Commission as they put together Singing the Living Tradition, our gray hardcover hymnal. It boggles my mind that a few years from now, that hymnal will be 30 years old. But then it also boggles my mind that four of my five grandchildren are of voting age and two of them are married. My father, who some of you knew, grew up in a self-sufficient farm in Sydney, Maine. He was the youngest of five. When he complained for the lack of something, his parents would say, it's tougher where there's none. And that response suited all sorts of situations. My parents passed it on to me. So I learned to hold back my complaints, feeling like there was always somebody having a tougher time than me. And no matter what the problem. Um, so 82 years into life, I've discovered that isn't always healthy. When we're faced with losses, with grief, with failures, with pain, with the uprooting of our lives, there's no pushing it away with a simple aphorism. The reality comes back over and over. Yet somehow, even in the midst of trouble, we may do well to remember that behind a covering of clouds, that Milky Way galaxy is still as brilliant as it's ever been. The Taj Mahal, dulled from centuries of air pollution in northern India, is still an example of radiant architectural art. In northern Oregon, a place recently scarred by terrible fires, Multnomah Falls, the second highest cascade in the U.S., still drops an inspiring 620 feet on its way to the Columbia River. Even if obscured by dense smoke, the sound of that cataract reminds me that there are other ways of seeing. So here we are, looking at a more than painful failure of our country's 20 year involvement, an enormous endeavor and sacrifice in Afghanistan. I'm not finding any way to put a good spin on this. What about the millions for whom this is home? Can we possibly imagine how devastating this must be? I'm hoping there will be other ways of seeing, other paths of survival, other ways of recovery, just not visible at all right now. I'm hoping light will be reflected and discovered in unexpected places.
souls ride from darkness to light. Orbits elliptical, circle the sun. Yet in the nebula dwells the heart that one. Galaxies shining where time cannot trace. Dwarfed by the concept of air and in space. Tiny beginnings are hid from our sight. Miracles, spinnings of infinite might. Joined in the moment that cannot be named Filled with a power that cannot be framed Do you remember how wonderful it was to watch and listen to a young woman, Amanda Gorman, at the end of the Biden-Harris inauguration last January. And she ended her poem with these lines, which I use for my closing words. For there is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it.